Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Um, just to let you all know, um, uh, I'm glad to be here in Montreal, um, and, um, and my presentation will be completely in French. So uh, I'll be prepared. <laughs> so I'm just joking. I thought I'd try that out. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, first, I, I want to thank the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies for hosting this discussion on Ethiopia. Um, you know, a country of over 100 million that's on the brink of collapse. Um, I also want to especially thank Hone Mandefro for his guidance in preparation for this event, and Kyle Matthews, director of MIGS, for, uh, for his support. Um, Ethiopia is at a critical point right now. Uh, the only comparable time in recent history is during the late 80s when the communist regime was about to fall. After 27 years of central control with ruthless military response to any threat of a challenge to their rule, the ruling party is not able to govern the country because there is unrest and tension in almost every corner of the country. There is pressure internally from the Ethiopian people, namely from the two largest ethnic groups, Amharas and Oromos. These two ethnic groups make up almost 70% of the population, and they are leading the protests against this authoritarian government. The Ethiopian government is also facing external pressure by virtue of being in a bad neighborhood, and from the Ethiopians in the diaspora getting organized and pushing for policy changes in their uh, new um, uh, found countries. Uh, my fellow pa uh, panelists, Mulligan and, and, um, and Felix, will do a much better job than I detailing the human rights atrocities that have been committed by the ruling party since they were elevated to power in 1991. So it doesn't give justice to this event for me to, to repeat these horrific details. Instead, I will try to focus on the cause of the turmoil in Ethiopia with some, a little bit of historical background of the ruling party and why the instability of Ethiopia should matter to Canadians, Americans, and Western Europe, Western Europe the largest providers, uh, providers of aid to the Ethiopian government. To understand the turmoil Ethiopia is facing, we must first understand how the ruling party, Tigray People's Liberation Front, or TPLF, came into power in 1991, and the political structure that is at the center of the political turmoil we see today. As the name implies, the goal of the architects of the rebel group, TPLF, in the 1960s was to secede from Ethiopia and create an independent country for the Tigray ethnic group based on communist ideology. In order to organize and build membership for this radical ideology, they needed a scapegoat or a big boogeyman to blame the issues facing Ethiopia and, and the Tigray people. Um, and in the same vein that you know, Hitler found the Jews as a scapegoat, TPLF's scapegoat was the Amara people. It was written in their 1976 manifesto where they labeled their struggle as anti-Amara. It, it is only through this struggle and dividing people along fabricated ethnic boundaries that they may be able to secede from Ethiopia and establish the ruling of uh, the Republic of Tigray. TPLF has taken this manifesto and codified it as Ethiopian policy. As a result, Amaras have been marginalized and become second-class citizens in their own country. That's why their first victims were Amaras in the Wolkai region, which they forcefully annexed to the Tigray region and began to ethnically cleanse Amaras from this region. One of the things you may be aware of is, uh, maybe unaware of is, Ethiopia is divided, like I said, among ethnic lines. So you have the Amara region, the Oromo region, the Tigray region. And that's very unique uh, uh, in, in, um, in, in, in this world. There are not, I don't think you can find any country that's you know, divided among ethnic lines. Uh, TPLF accession to power was due to a power vacuum created as a result of the many warring parties during the Ethiopian Civil War. During their armed struggle, TPLF only fought in the Tigray region. They never ventured to other parts of Ethiopia because their aspiration was not Ethiopian. In fact, TPLF never had a vision uh, of Ethiopia. The leadership believed to achieve their goal, to their end goal of an independent Tigray, they must destroy the identity, history, culture and idea of Ethiopia, which they associated with the Amara people. After coming to power in 1991, TPLF divided Ethiopia along fabricated ethnic boundaries to divide the people and destroy this idea of Ethiopia that had existed for almost 3,000 years. An Ethiopian from one ethnic region will feel like a stranger in another ethnic region because they do not speak the same language and come from different governing systems. The political structure of Ethiopia is made up of four ethnic-based political parties. They are Amara National Democratic Movement, Oromos People's Democratic um, Organization, Southern Ethiopian People's Democratic Movement, and Tigray People's Liberation Front. 
These four ethnically based organizations are part of a front called Ethiopian People's Revo Revolutionary Democratic Front, or EPRDF, where they are supposed to equally share power and decision making. However, in reality, the party controlling the political power, TPLF, is the party representing the smallest ethnic group in this conglomeration, representing only about 6% 6 of the Ethiopian population. TPLF controls the political agenda and policies not only in the Tigray region, but in all parts of Ethiopia. The other three political parties are nothing more than a facade existing to implement TPLF policies. Ethiopians know they do not have political representation and they feel the absence of this representation in their daily lives. In the last general election in 2015, the TPLF-led political party, Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, won 100% of their parliamentary seats and 99% of their regional elections. And, um, and, and clearly, that's an improvement from the 2010 election where they only won 99.9% .9 of the parliamentary election. There was only one opposition party member in the 2010 election. Uh, you don't need any more proof than this to understand the level of oppression and corruption by this regime and frustration by the Ethiopian people. There has been a four-year sustained uprising by the Amaras and Oromo ethnic group. The protests are not because of lack of jobs or economy as the Ethiopian government likes to spin it. The protests are in response to land grab and identity politics. For the Oromos, Anwaks, and other ethnic groups, they are being forcefully removed from lands they have lived in for thousands of years and being, sold, and being sold for pennies on the dollar to foreign investors, with profits going to the pockets of corrupt TPLF officials and other affiliated with the government. Ethiopians do not believe they have a national military. They believe the military and intelligence systems exist to protect the interests of TPLF. The reason is because TPLF has a complete grip on the military and intelligence apparatus. Majority of the generals in the Ethiopian military and the heads of the intelligence unit are from the Tigray group. <coughs> The reason they are able to control the politics is because of the tight control they have on the military and intelligence apparatus, which has allegiance only to TPLF. The Ethiopian people, especially Amaras and Oromos, have felt the brunt of the TPLF military these past four years. As an Ethiopian and a humanitarian, it is shocking and shameful that almost one million Oromos have been displaced in the last part of 2017 from their homes by the Somali Liu police orchestrated by the TPLF regime to stoke ethnic violence, and there's hardly any news coverage by the Western media. There's almost a million people in a matter of like three months that were displaced, and you hardly hear about it in any news out here. For Amaras, it's a fight for survival. As stated in the 2007 Ethiopian census that was released in 2010, the Amara population was short by almost 2.5 million. A debate was not even allowed in parliament when this fact was presented. Some estimates have the number now closer to six million. We believe there has been a systematic effort by the government to depopulate the Amara population. Again, shockingly, there was zero media coverage of nearly six million missing people. In addition, historical lands where Amaras have lived for thousands of years, such as Walkai, Raya, Zebo, and others have been forcefully annexed to the Tigray region, and Amaras ethnically cleansed from said lands and fl uh, fleeing to other parts of Ethiopia. Thus, the recent protest by Amaras was not about democracy or economics, but was simply about their identity, their land, and the need to survive as a people. It is cri critical that policymakers understand the root cause of the protest in Ethiopia if they, were, if they want to be part of the solution. As a result of the protests across the country, the TPLF regime had deployed their military and Agazi special forces in mainly the Amara and Oromo regions. Thousands have been killed during these past four years, and tens of thousands arrested and tortured. Cities with major Amara population centers such as Gondor and Bahardar are still under military occupation. There is tension in almost every region with large Amara population. Now for the first time in 27 years, the TPLF EPRDF hegemony has shown cracks in its central governance. The OPDO leadership notably has been pushing back against the TPLF governing body. In some cases, openly defying TPLF policies which a year ago would have been unthinkable. For the ANDM has not shown the same level of defiance as OPDO, but has been inching closer to OPDO. For the first time in its governing history, Amara and Oromo MPs boycotted parliament in December until the prime minister ad addressed the ongoing ethnic clashes, something that would have been unheard of just maybe six months ago. 
It is hard to know to what extent this internal turmoil within the party is genuine, but still it is another sign of the weakening of the TPLF domination of e on Ethiopian politics. The four-year unrest has also had a devastating impact on the economy, with Ethiopia running out of foreign currency, as admitted by the National Bank of Ethiopia, which has led to shortage of basic goods and has exasperated the situation even further. After 27 years of authoritarian rule and loss of thousands of lives, Ethiopians have completely lost trust in this government. There are parts of Ethiopia now without government services, but instead managed by traditional form of governance led by elders. So, why else? Beside the systematic slaughter of tens of thousands of ethnic minor, uh, minorities and, and actually majorities, should Canadians, Americans, and Europeans care and be engaged in Ethiopia? Let's start with corruption. Western donors contribute almost 60% of Ethiopia's national budget. In the past 26 years, it's estimated that Ethiopia has received over $30 billion from the United States and almost $20 billion from our European allies. In addition, remittance from Ethiopians living abroad in Canada, America, and Western Europe contributes billions of dollars uh, yearly. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs reported Ethiopia earned in excess of $4 billion for the 2016 fiscal budget, which exceeds Ethiopia's export trade earnings over the same period. And this is just money coming from Ethiopians living abroad. The $4 billion does not take into account billions of dollars more that come into the country outside of the legal financial channels. Still, Ethiopia ranks as one of the poorest corrupt countries in the world. Independent research from African Union, IMF, IMF and World Bank has revealed a corrupt system where, near, whereby two to three billion annually is leaving the country. In a country that is tightly controlled by a tiny mi minority, the billions of dollars are only going to the development of a specific region and the pockets of a few individuals. According to Oxfam, Ethiopia is again facing a massive famine with an estimated 8.5 million Ethiopians facing severe hunger. Where is all the aid from the US and Canada going? Where is the accountability from the donor countries for this tax aid? Where is the accountability for these gross human rights violations? Freedom House ranks Ethiopia as not free and has one of the worst human rights records of any country. So why do we continue to turn a blind eye to the financial and human accountability? This is not representative of democratic form of governance and may even be a failure by our own democratic government to account for taxpayer aid. Unaccountable support to the Ethiopian government does not serve the national security interests of Canada, United States, and our European allies. The Ethiopian government is a destabilizing factor to the region and its own citizens. Thousands of Ethiopians are fleeing the country with the hopes of reaching Europe or America for safety, putting pressure on neighboring countries in Europe. Imagine, as bad as Yemen, Libya, and Somalia are, thousands of Ethiopians are fleeing Ethiopia through these countries to reach the Gulf countries, Europe, and America for a better life. Because they have completely lost hope in Ethiopia and have such dire fear of, of, uh, of the government, they are risking their lives by paying with smugglers, walking thousands of miles, and in some cases, as we've seen recently, sold as slaves in Libya because they believe there's a better life elsewhere. Today, the protests have been largely peaceful, which is rare for an uprising that is going into its fourth year. However, as the TPLF military, federal police, and Agazi special forces continue to massacre innocent civilians, more and more Amaras will begin arming themselves in order to defend their families and their homelands. Our organization, Amara Association of America, as well as many diaspora groups and international human rights organizations have been trying to get the attention of the donor countries to be more engaged to stop the bloodshed and avoid a brewing civil war. So what can Canada, the United States, and Europe do to help the Ethiopian people who are dying for a better future and avoid a state collapse? As you can see above, Western donor countries have a lot of leverage on the Ethiopian government. We should not ignore the state terror of Ethiopian government against its own people because we need their help fighting terrorism in Somalia. The Canadian government and European Union can follow similar efforts taking place in the U.S. Through our advocacy efforts and many others, there was a hearing before the U.S. Congress in 2016 on the humanitarian crisis in Ethiopia, and two resolutions introduced by Congress in the House and Senate to shed light on the crisis. The resolutions passed the respected Foreign Affairs Committee unanimously, and we are pushing to have them passed by both bodies of Congress. House Resolution 128 now has 74 co-sponsors, and Senate Resolution 168 has 22 co-sponsors. 
The hearing and the two resolutions have put a lot of pressure on the TPLF-led government, causing it to spend in excess of $150,000 per month on lobbyists. They have also used the full resources of the Ethiopian Demo Demo uh, Diplomatic Corps to stop the resolution from being passed. Last week, I chaired a delegation of five Ethiopian American advocacy groups in a successful negotiation with the Majority Leader's Office on the terms of House Resolution 128. Anticipating the meeting, the Ethiopian government announced the release of thousands of political prisoners. This is the first time the Ethiopian government acknowledged that it even has political prisoners. Why is the TPLF-led regime spending so much money to stop these two resolutions, including threatening to stop participating in anti-terrorism operations in Somalia? Because that's the threat that they put on the, um, the US government. One, both resolutions detail the human rights atrocities committed by the Ethiopian security forces. Number two, both resolutions detail the lack of political space for opposition political parties. Number three, both resolutions detail politically motivated arrests and torture of politicians, journalists, and activists and calls for their release. Four, both resolutions call on the State Department and USAID for more accountability of US tax dollars and work closely with the Ethiopian government to improve democracy and human rights. Number five, both resolutions call on the State Department and Treasury to use the Global Magnitsky Act to hold individuals and entities responsible for human rights violations accountable anywhere in the world, which includes visa travel bans and freezing overseas financial assets. We are expecting to have another hearing by the U.S. Congress sometime this, this spring, and in the next six to nine months, possibly another legislation that, even much, that is even much stronger. If the Canadian government and European Union take similar steps, we will see improvements in Ethiopia very quickly. The reason is simply because those that will be targeted who are in power are a small minority, and once they feel the external pressure, they will bend as they are doing now. The past two weeks have been especially challenging for the Amara people. Military and special forces have massacred Amaras in northern Warlow areas, in Waldia during the celebration of Epiphany, in Kobo and Mursa. The number of deaths now stands close to, to 50 this, uh, the, the past two weeks, with, another, with, uh, with hundreds more wounded and untold numbers arrested. This includes the death of a 12-year-old boy who was shot five times. I have a 14-year-old son, and I could not imagine my son being killed in this manner and having to bury him before he has uh, even lived out his childhood. We should not turn our backs when cruelty is being carried out against the, innocent, against the innocent, especially when our tax dollars, in the billions, are partly financing the brutality. So I appeal to your humanity and your democratic values to ask the government of Prime Minister Trudeau to act and to help the Ethiopian people in their quest for survival and freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for uh, an extremely detailed uh, analysis and, and of what's happening in your homeland, uh, but also um, mentioning possible pathways uh, that Western countries can, can implement to try to help the population. And, and I would note the Magnitsky Act that you mentioned, that, that's really important because that's something that, that fellow Montrealer Erwin Kotler, former Minister of Justice, uh, lobby the Canadian government to, to use, and it's being deployed a few times against the Russian government and against the government of Venezuela for human rights abuses, but, but I agree with you that that's a, that's a tool that needs to be examined by multiple other states, not just Canada. And then next, I would like to ask, uh, invite uh, Mulukin to come up and, and take his turn. I believe he has a PowerPoint presentation, and it will work. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, 
everybody. Uh, I would like to say thank you uh, for those who worked uh, just to realize this event. And uh, I would like to present about the silent genocide of the Amara people of Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia is now at the crossroads uh, and there is an active resistance in Ethiopia, especially in the Amara and Oromia area. Uh, I would like to assume the audience of this seminar uh, would rather like me to talk about the hot issue, but I will be uh, dealing my presentation about the past and uh, particularly the recent past history of the Amara people. Unfortunately, it's not just uh, a rosy picture, rather uh, uh, I believe, you know, documenting the past and especially uh, the recent past is very important to chart the future. Uh, this paper is extracted, the uh, upcoming book, the Amara Holocaust. Actually, the book is, uh, I mean, written and uh, read by uh, in Amharic language, uh, which is the official language and the most widely spoken language in Ethiopia. And uh, so this paper is extracted from uh, the English version of this book. And uh, yeah, thank you. So uh, I'll just try to sum up what's going on, uh, what has been done, and what's going on in uh, Ethiopia, especially in the Amara people. Uh, so I would, I would like to start on the Wolkite area. As you can see from the map, uh, this area is uh, the most uh, fertile and productive area in Africa, uh, in East Africa, I can say that. One of the world's best quality season is produced here, and Ethiopia's gold production, the lion's share of the Ethiopian gold, gold production is also produced here. And the area covers about uh, 12,000 square kilometers. And this area, this most productive area, uh, is forcefully an exit to the ruling group, the Tigray region. The people are Amaras, but the region forcefully an exit uh, by denying their identity. Uh, Wolkite is one of the Amara historical area, actually. And uh, still, you know, anyone who is interested to do a research, there is an active genocide on this area. Over half a million of the Amara people have been displaced evicted, and uh, on the evicted people, uh, about 600,000 ethnically Tigrayans came and resettled with the funds of Westerners, unfortunately. The German People's uh, International Food, uh, International Fund, GIZ, GIZ, sponsored the resettlement and the evacuation of, you know, these areas. Um, so, the US side defied EU, all governments and Western agencies had you know, funded uh, for the resettlement and uh, you know, the uh, infrastructures which have been built around here. But the Wolkaites, the indigenous people, they are evicted, killed, and uh, migrated to other countries. Even they are not allowed to live in Ethiopia. Most of them, have been migrated to Sudan, Europe, Canada, America. You know, they are dispersed everywhere, you know. They are not allowed to live there because identically they are Amara. And when they clamor just their identities to be respected, they will be killed. They are hunted, you know, as if they were, you know, uh, animals. Uh, just, uh, uh, sorry to say this, but, you know, animals, you know, uh, animals are, you know, anima uh, the rights of animals are here uh, respected. But there, it's very unfortunate to say that, you know, people are hunted, like hunting animals, you know. Uh, when we see, when we go to, to the other region, and uh, Ben Shangulbum's region, it's just the dam region. Ethiopia is uh, now trying to build the largest dam in Africa, that re in that region, uh, about 10,000 to 15,000, you know, estimated, you know, Amharas have been massacred and killed 
uh, from 1991 to 1995. The whole region was uh, littered with the body of the victims, and it was possible to encounter a body or more within a radius of 50 to 100 meters. The stitch emanating from the rotten corpse uh, was intolerable by the time. In 1994, in an open market lo located in uh, so-called area of Howie, uh, the buyers and the vendors were coming together just to do their usual task. Unfortunately enough, when the market uh, was you know, running, all those people who were there have been massacred. And the number of people killed in that open market were assumed to be more than 5,000. You know, their uh, dead bodies were, you know, cleaned by uh, excavator like, you know, just. Uh, in June 2015, I mean in uh, 2013, about 10,000 Hamaras have been evicted and some were dead. Uh, uh, you know, uh, in 2015, immediately after the election, in, in Ethiopia, every five years, there's, you know, a symbolic ele national election. We know that there is no change, there will not come change, but there's a symbolic, ch symbolic vote. So immediately after that symbolic election, about 160 Amaras were killed, and their dead bodies were thrown to rivers. When we see, you know, the Wolderga area, here it's just the western part of Ethiopia. Here, uh, over 14,000 Amaras were evicted and about 1,000 were killed uh, by the special uh, police and defense force. By the time, you know, Ethiopia was fighting with uh, neighboring uh, uh, Eritrea, uh, but the military was also, you know, killing people who were just living and settling peacefully for uh, decades, even for you know, centuries. Uh, 40 children were uh, carrying on their parents back where, you know, uh, thrown to you know, the burning houses, and their life, you know, they're burned with the houses. Uh, in a building or in an area in Urlaga that I showed you on, on the map, uh, women were sexually assaulted, uh, you know, all properties of Amaras were destroyed, churches were burned, uh, 